Laura, one of the day is Thursday, July 27th, 2023. And this is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls for being here tonight. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. Thank you so much. All right, we're going to talk about well, current market conditions. Obviously, I have a lot to say about that, especially with today's action. It's maybe not as bad as it felt. It always feels a lot worse than it is sometimes. Your questions on trading your favorite stock and crypto picks. If you don't mind, hold it off until we get to the live charts. That way I won't get confused as to what's been covered and what hasn't been covered. So what we're going to focus on. Well, I have a plethora of knowledge today. Tonight it's one of those shows where I actually started in one direction and ended in about 15 different other ones. I want to talk a little bit, little bit about the big pull, and that's getting into positions, taking partial profits, and sticking with them, or in some cases with the market timing, just getting into the market and riding out the trends. I want to talk a little bit about why we use stops, free rolling entries, and a bunch of more stuff. So let's just jump right into that. Before we do that, there's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading ours off to sum it up. All predictions are about the future and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Thank you, Greg Morris, for that. All right, let's talk about the big pull. The reason I use the word big pull is Livermore talks a lot about the big pull in Reminiscence of a Stock Opera. And as you know, I've been doing a series on that. And I think uh, the 10th one should drop tomorrow. Last week was actually the ninth one, although it was labeled the 10th. But we're we're up to, we're caught up to 10 now, and anyway, Livermore talks a lot about where the real big money is. Livermore started in the bucket shops where they would actually bucket the orders and they would try to make the traders go out of business. But he actually would read the tape and the bucket shops would close you down if you lost more than 10 percent. Which actually worked out well for Livermore because he would ride the trends and if he was wrong, he would get stopped out. But he later found in real markets where they actually would place the order your fills were much, much different. But anyway, what I'll digress you too for, the point I'm trying to make there is that he later realized that the real money was in these longer term trends. In fact, when he went to New York and tried to trade like he always had traded, he realized that he couldn't do it because the slippage was just uh, absolutely killing him. So he, he couldn't go in and out like a madman. He had to rethink what he was doing. Anyway, that's got me thinking a lot about the big pull and that's the whole shtick when it comes to my methodology, it's not the swing trading, which although I'm slighted as a swing trader, it's really more hanging on for these longer term gains. And we chip away at it, chip away at it, chip away at it, win a little, lose a little, win a little, lose a little, and then bam, we knock it out of the park. Anyway, I want to just kind of touch upon the TFM 10% system. And we appear, and knock on wood, I know it was a little bumpy today, but we appear to have a, a Nice longer term trend emerging. So this is a weekly chart. And the system was originally designed to get you out of the way, which I'll show you in one second, in bear markets with the S&P 500. And knock on wood, based on historical testing and the last, I forget how many years it's been out. I want to say five years. It seems like it's been out for a little while. I have no concept of time. <laughs> time anymore now that I've gotten a little bit older. Anyway, I set out to prove that a simple system could work. And this little line here, which I dubbed the buy line, which is probably a bad name for it. Maybe it's the sell line, but basically you want to bail out of the market when it gets below its and the 50 simple moving average. And all that is, is the 50 week closing high less 10%. Now, once you get 50 weeks, it takes at least 50 weeks for this to begin to drop. And in a way, that's a good thing because it doesn't get you back in the Landry line. I like that. Thank you, Jeff. It doesn't get you back in too soon, or it certainly helps to avoid some whipsaw. Now, over time, the cool thing about this system, which I never thought about until I started trading it and watching it in real time is that the line does have a lot of lag in it and it eventually starts catching up with price when you have a longer term gradual kind of bottoming process like uh was it 2000 i think the bottom in 2008 if memory serves was a or was it 2009 
was a very kind of gradual bottom and the system caught up to the market. But the system will not catch up initially to the overall market because it's looking back at that recent all-time high or 50-week high, whatever the case may be. In this case, it was a 50-week high and an all-time high. So it's going to look at that all-time high, and until 50 weeks, it's not going to start dropping. Anyway, you can see after 50 weeks in this particular case, it did begin to drop because this, this high remained the 50-week high for 50 weeks. Anyway, you can see once it starts dropping, it continues to drop. Here's an example here. So it drops. And then, the, and then the next high is a little bit lower somewhere in here, and it keeps going off of that. So it depends on how, how the week's set up. But anyway, it, as a general statement, it takes a while to set up. Now, once you get two bars of Landry light, meaning lows are greater than the moving average, and this is just a 50 simple moving average. I wanted something with a lot of lag, something that was nice and slow as opposed to an EMA, which I use on my daily charts because it catches up the price a little faster. And the 30 EMA is my favorite EMA for now. But anyways, you got, anyway, you have two bars of Landry light and you also have a close above that buy line, meaning that you're within 10% of the 50 week closing high, which is probably, let's see, right here, probably the, right there, that high right there is your 50 week closing high. So I went long on that day, and I got in a little bit before the close on that Friday at 319.49, only picked up 100 shares, just a kind of, I guess, for kind of S&Gs, but kind of halfway serious about following the system just to see what would happen, especially since the NASDAQ was moving a lot better than the P's at the time. So based on 382.05, and now we're a couple of points lower than that, so take a couple of points couple hundred dollars off the calculations here, but you subtract the 319.49 where I got in, and then you come up to 62.56, and you multiply that times 100, and that's $6,256, or probably about 6,000 now based on the slide that I took after I took this uh, snapshot. And I think a couple of you guys actually went long the S&P 500, maybe vis-a-vis -vis the spiders on this signal. So if anybody here went long, let me know. Uh, if not, I'll ask in Facebook. But I'm, I'm pretty sure a couple of you guys went long too. So we both got long around the same time or exactly the same time. Now, as I alluded to a minute ago, the designer's intent with this was to get you out of the market when things begin to go sour. And my thinking is just technical analysis one-on-one -on -one, is that if a market is going to lose 50% of its value, it's going to lose 10% of its value first. Now, to avoid some of the whipsaw, I added in the fact that it must also close below the 50-week moving average. But in this case, the moving average was fairly close to price. So your exit was right there. Now, what's interesting is you had a pretty serious drop. In fact, the market dropped 27% or the Qs dropped 20 seven percent from that sell signal and and that's nothing to sneeze at that's a lot of money that's like a hundred points i think and the cues if you hold on even if you only have 100 shares that's what ten thousand dollars that's a lot of money to lose and if you're let's say you've got a million dollars saved up for retirement or you're saving for retirement you got a million bucks and you lose 27 percent that's what two hundred seventy thousand dollars if you keep losing money at that rate your retirement is going to look a heck of a lot different anyway the slide that happens after you exit and i've showed the spreadsheet quite a bit but i'll show it uh maybe in upcoming weeks i'll show the spreadsheet but the the amount the market act drops after you exit is is what i've dubbed the diaper change and that's a term I borrowed from Ian McActivy. I'm sure he doesn't mind with that. He's no longer with us, but he was a fantastic guy. That's one that I missed. That's one that I wish I'd have spent a little more time picking his brain. Anyway, I want to follow up on this SIM trade. We had a nice accelerated persistent uptrend. We had a pullback to the moving average. This is a 30 EMA. This is a Landry Light pullback. And then you can see the Landry light down below. That just counts the number of bars of Landry light. And then it went back down to zero. So you had about 30 bars of Landry light, drops to zero. 
And he had all this other good stuff, persistency, acceleration. Notice a gradual trend here. And then it begins to accelerate. That's a pattern I call accelerating momentum strategy. So we had entry above the market as usual, stop down here, IPTF here. And then we had a pretty good run. And then it sets up again as another Landry Light pullback. Now, last week I talked about the issues with going back to the well. And psychologically, that can be kind of tough because in this case, we made about 2,500, 3,500 total, I think, on this trade. And you're feeling pretty good about it. And you're like, okay, well, let's go back in, let's do it again. But what if you lose this time? Well, this time, then you're gonna be bummed out. Like, wow, I should have just, should have just been happy with my $3,500. But then if it takes off without you, then there's there's the flip side of that. And there's also, you could be feeling some endowment effect and that's where you've held this stock for a couple of months, two or three months, and you've got a nice handsome profit and it becomes your best friend. And number one, you don't wanna stop out and that's where people get in a lot of danger. Once they're in the stock for a while, they sometimes just won't honor their stop. I see that happens all the time. So you gotta be really careful either way, either that you previously loved the stock or you, let's say you lost money on a stock that it sets up again. And it might be hard to take that second setup because the second time, let's say you lose twice in a row, then you're really gonna feel like an idiot. You'll feel like the definition of insanity doing the same thing over and over expecting a different outcome. Anyway, stop was there, IPT was there. So let's take a look at what happened on the first loaf, I'm sorry, the first trade and the first loaf, uh, we divide the stock position into two lows, okay? There's a trending loaf and the trading loaf. I think the second, inch, first time I think it was 400 shares. So we flip out 200 at five points, 4,000 bucks. That's on a 100K account. Your account is bigger then you would be risking 2% of that account value. Obviously the account is smaller for your trading. You'd be risking a little bit less. But to keep the math easy, I use round numbers, 100K being the round number. And you can see when you hit that IPT, you bring that stop up to break even. That's just the basic money management. And then you gradually let that stop loosen up over time and trail it higher. So we got stopped out right around the moving average for $2,500 on the second loaf per 100K. And then we went back in, we banked the thousand, trailed that stop higher, got it to break even, and then we broke even in this particular case on the remainder. So if you look down below, those are the trades from the hypothetical open portfolio. I personally took 400 on this first loaf. That's why I had 400 in my mouth, on my mouth, in my mind, on my mind, he tried to say. But it was really 185 times two, what's that, 370. And I rounded up to 400. So there's the returns on the hypothetical portfolio. Thousand in the first loaf, 2,500 in the second. Went back in, thousand dollars, and then zero. Add all that up, 4,500 dollars over a few months' time. That's better than the poking eye. And on the 100K accounts, that is a four to half percent gain, and or I guess any size account too, uh, depending on as long as you adjust your share size accordingly. But you can see that we made 50% on the trending loaf of that trade, 20% on the first loaf, 50% on the second, and then went back in, made 23%, and then 0%. And basically what we're doing is we're jockeying for position to ride out a longer term trend. We're jockeying position for that big pull, and that's where the money is. So everything I showed you was hypothetical, and you're probably wondering, well, what did you do? I have what I call my model account. Now, I call it my model account, but I do all kind of other stuff in that account too. I do zero DTE, I do uh, occasional, or maybe not so occasional, <laughs> intraday trades, and a bunch of other stuff. But I always try to mimic exactly what I'm recommending in the service, just so I'm practicing what I preach. So you can see, here's my actual trades. And if you add them all up, I made 988 on the first loaf in the first trade. And I think I might have gotten out slightly early on that because the big money's in the second trade. And as you can see, that worked out pretty nicely. And then 862 on the second versus 1,000 and then 50 bucks somehow when I stopped out. I might have used a little discretion. 
oh, I know what I did in this particular case. I used discretion on the stop. And what I did was I put in a trailing stop and the market spiked up and followed it up and it got me out a little bit above where uh, the original protective stop was supposed to be. Now, God kind of laughs at your plans. My When I came in this morning, portfolio looked fantastic. And I was thinking that, you know what, I'm going to keep beating the dead horse on this longer term trend trading because we have so many winners in the portfolio. And by the end of the day, we only had two winners in here that are free roll in the BTBT and the riot. I guess we came in with two winners and then I expected the rest of the portfolio to look a little bit better. But then the market sort of tanked, as you know. We'll take a look at that in just one second. All right. If you like this video, then please like it on YouTube if you're watching it there. If you're live, thank you for attending tonight. If you want to attend it live, DaveLander.com slash webinar. See the links below if you're watching on YouTube. If you don't like it, go have no fun somewhere else. <laughs> but if you do like it, please like it and subscribe. Also, become a gold member of DaveLander.com. And I have courses that are immediately available, hours and hours of courses. And then you're able to unlock the premium courses over time. So it really pays for itself. There's thousands of dollars worth of courses that'll be unlocked over time. The IPO course, Trading Full Circle. And then I think eventually you get the big one, which is the stock selection course. Anyway, all the setups I show you in here, unless it's an IPO we talk about on Facebook or something, come directly from my trading service. So if you want the setups live, davelander.com slash trading service. All right, let's get back into it. Why we use stops. This was, well, first of all, I'm going to show you something that a guru has never shown you. People get all excited when I say, you know, when I'm in person, I say that. They get all excited. Everybody sits up in the chair. A few people wake up. <laughs> and it, it's a bit of a bummer because I'm basically just going to show you a losing trade. But I think it makes for a great example of money management. By the way, I've been working on a piece lately about people often say, hey, Dave, I think your setups are cherry picked. And it's like, well, you're gosh darn right they are. And the reason I show you all these great trades is because there's active money management, there's the entry, there's the stops, there's the trailing stops, there's additional profit tour. there's a lot of work in it. But if you get in a stinker, other than the entry and the stop, there's really not a whole lot to do. And obviously, I think every stock that I personally trade or recommend has the potential to be this huge, huge winner. But I know that. I'm not the grand poobah, and sometimes we lose, and sometimes we lose more than we want to. Well, I don't lose at all, but anyway, you get the idea. Anyway, so this one, we bumped the stop just a little bit when it moved a little bit in our favor, and then it stopped out. So you can see, instead of losing a full $2,000, which would be 2% of the account, we lost like $1,600 and change right here. So that's uh, 1616 or something, I think, 1636. So that's a bit of a bummer. And you're probably thinking, mother, father. But it could always be worse. So if you fast forward, based on that spike low we had today, at least at the low, you'd have been out $6,181. So there, my little Cajun just, my Cajun just slipped out. I said, there. So there is why we use protective stops. And believe me, if you haven't been trading that long, it's not that easy to make back that $6,000. I know I just showed a trade we did 4,500 on. Those will come along every day, unfortunately. Okay, we had a discretionary situation today and we were talking about it in Facebook. And it seems like uh, at least two of you did take the trade and about a half a dozen of you did not, based on the feedback that I've gotten today. And by the way, I love I love it when you guys give me feedback on on the trades from the trading service because I, it really helps me quite a bit. And it also lets me know whether or not I'm getting through and whether or not I need to kind of change my approach to make sure I'm getting my point across. Anyway, by the way, discretion is something that you don't need to use every day, all day, but every now and then using it can really 
help you out. And when I say every now and then, it's probably about once every three months, you might get a stop, Nick. I think I tried to hang on. Uh, QBTS, I tried to hang on. Didn't work, so it cost me a little money on that. But let's say I was able to hang on, meaning that the stop only went, the stock only went, let's say, a few cents below my stop, and I was able to hang on. And let's say it took off and went up 100% or 1,000%. Then that extra $100 or whatever the risk was in this particular case would have been more than paid for by catching that winner. In fact, you catch one big winner, you might pay for a half a dozen or maybe even a dozen of discretion calls. Now, there, the downside of discretion, just real quick, because I did use discretion on the KNF trade, and like I just said, in half a dozen, you guys did too, at least. But the downside is, and one of you guys was bummed out because you took it, it's like, well, don't be bummed out because tomorrow it might gap open and we're going to be the hurt and pops. And that's the downside of trading is the trade-off of something like using discretion. Anyway, I wanted to just kind of show you a hypothetical in here. And this does happen. I didn't have time to go find a real example, but I'm sure we have plenty of them where you have an entry on a stock, nice little generic pullback, and then the stock gaps higher well above the entry but immediately implodes so in a case like that that is a no-brainer you want to avoid that and by the way if you're new er to trading or new er to my methodology then by all means follow things mechanically until you go through a few cycles and until you or at least until you learn some of the ways to improve upon your performance with a little bit of discretion Anyway, so this is what it looks like. The entry was right here at 45.25, and it made a really fast move on the open. It just kind of shot straight up in here, and it did technically hit that trigger, but it only went like five cents above it. So I was sitting here waiting to get in, waiting to get in, like, okay, it's 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 triggered. I need to get in. I need to get in. I need to mimic the service. And then it began to implode. It says, okay, I'm going to put in my entry just above the opening range here. And I put the entry at 45.30 in this particular case. Once it began to implode a little bit, once it was down to like 45, sorry, 44.75, I put in my new entry just above the day's high. So if you don't jump in on the first trigger and then the market immediately begins to reverse, then you want to put in an entry just above that high. Now, let's say it just kept meandering around this 45, 20, 45, 25, bouncing back and forth. Then maybe you might want to give it a little bit more wiggle room on that entry. Now, you will be making a little bit less money on the first low for the trade, okay, the swing trade portion. But that's not where the real money is. That just kind of keeps you in the game, kind of kind of like the last sim trade. You make a 1000 bucks and then you scratch out. Well, that's 1% of your account. That's better than a poke in the eye, right? And then it allows you to say, next, go out and find your next big winner. Now, when it does make, these are the hardest ones to use discretion on, these fast moves on the open, because sometimes it might spike past the entry and then come right back in. In this particular case, it kind of stalled out right around the entry, but it did technically trigger, okay? So that's where you got to make that go or no-go decision, whereas the hypothetical example just showed you that does happen fairly often. You want to maybe look to enter a, with a little bit of wiggle room above that gap, but if it immediately reverses, then it's a no-brainer. Like I just said, you avoid a potential losing trade. Now, the other thing you probably want to consider is the overall condition of the market. So here's a 10-minute chart of the spiders. Notice that the market found its high in the first 10 minutes of trading. So you're looking at that K and F and you're thinking, okay, it triggered. I need to get in. That's what Dave said to do. Well, hang on a minute. I see the market has already begun to reverse and reverse pretty hard. Looks like we got an opening gap reversal in the works. Maybe I need to be a little bit more lenient on my entry and wait a few more minutes to see if this thing begins to follow through. So it gapped higher, and it really didn't get much higher. And then it found its high in the first 10 minutes, sold off a little bit, bounced a little, but then began to implode for the rest of the day, as you know. Now, I kind of woke up thinking this big epiphany, the secret to trading, 
And then I realized I covered <laughs> something very similar last week. And this was going to dovetail nicely into all the free rolling and the, all the um, the winners we've had lately. But obviously, with today's action, not quite as impressive. But longer term, obviously, you will end up with some choppy markets. And what you want to do is you want to mostly wait until conditions are conducive, okay? You want to be super duper selective on your stock picking and premium non no carry, meaning first do no harm. That's a doctor's creed. And that applies to trading. If you sit on your hands while the market is chopping sideways, you're not going to do any harm to your account. You're not going to put any capital to harm's way. You're not going to make a whole lot, obviously. You might make a little interest, but at least you can sleep at night. And this is, again, where you want to be super selective because the overall market's really not helping you out that much. Now, I've had some great winners lately, and I attribute it to my skill, but I can guarantee you the market helped me quite a bit and and i see it all the time i'm gonna to get to this in one second but it's amazing i'll see it all the time i'll nurse people through choppy conditions tell them to tell them to hang in there and if they hang in there the market finally takes off and then all of a sudden they're like oh i got this you know and then they go off on their own and they don't realize there's a lot more to trading than that and then they also have to recognize when the conditions become choppy again but anyway i'll, I'll flesh that out in just one second so, of course, as usual, you want to use entries. And as I often preach, and I think I showed an example last week or week before, with something in the service that didn't trigger and then proceeded to lose about 70% of its value. Kind of looks like that EOS E trade I just showed you, except that this one never did trigger. And as I often say, people call me up, you know, somebody's going to call me up six months from now on, on something that didn't trigger recently and tell me they're down about 80 percent and they're going to chew me out and i'm going to have to go back and do the forensics and figure out that it never did trigger so it it happens over and over i know i beat the dead horse but i guarantee you anything i beat the dead horse on is something that i'm asked repeatedly repeatedly or got asked 10 minutes ago <laughs> when it comes to these presentations the other thing you want to make sure you're doing is make sure you're feeling that F yeah feeling. One thing I wrote about a little bit recently is to sell me on your setup, okay? So in the Facebook group, when people post stocks, I don't want I don't just want to see a bunch of charts. I want people to show me a chart, tell me why you like it. Is it accelerating? Is it persistent? Does it have Landry light? Does it have other trend qualifiers? Is it a nice, clean setup? Or are there no gaps against the trend? Is there any meaningful overhead resistance? And 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 that's why I beat the dead horse again on these things over and over again. I'll see a lot of people show charts, and the the the, the chart they show me looks absolutely fantastic. But if you back it out a little bit, a couple of clicks, you'll see that there's a big mountain of overhead resistance and as soon as you get in that trade, as soon as it begins to rally a little bit, I should say, it's going to be hitting that overhead supply, overhead resistance, however you want to look at it. And those people who bought in that trading range right above the market, they're going to be looking to get out of break even. So you're definitely not stacking, stock, stacking the odds against you. Now, let's say the market begins to trade kind of cleanly, like we've had recently. Then when conditions are conducive, you still want to remain selective. And the other thing you got to be really leery of is permanent income hypothesis. That's one of the few things I remember from my MBA. And I don't think it was an actual class. It was with one of the professors that I became friendly with. And we used to pal around a little bit. And uh, he was talking about that one time. And that's when you get it like a little say you get a, like a little cash windfall and it makes you feel like you're always going to have that cash windfall. And as I've said a thousand times, I've seen people do things like tell a boss to F off and to quit. It was one husband and wife I can think of in particular, they quit a very profitable business that they spent years building. And my, my old thinking was, Hey, you know what? And I think this was most of these stories come from 99 about this, um, 
permanent income hypothesis thing, but I see it all the time. I see it even in more recent times when the market began to take off. People are like, okay, I got it. I got it, Dave. Thanks. <laughs> you know, thanks for answering my questions for the last couple of years. I know you paid me, but even still, it's like, hey, just keep me on staff. But you got to re really be careful. And, and, you know, I get a little full of myself too. And then the market hands me my ass, or get my ass handed to me, I should say. And then that kind of uh, throttles me back a little bit. But you got to be really, 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 really careful. Like, okay, like uh, like one guy recently uh, started trading. And uh, this was back during the pandemic times when things were kind of going crazy when the markets finally started rallying. And he made 40%. Now it was a small account, but 40% is 40%, right? And he wanted to know if he could expect about 40% every month. And so I did the math, and I think that comes out to $185 million in a couple of years. And I think within five years, don't quote me on that, but it's it's pretty astronomical. Within five years, you're a billionaire. And then obviously then it grows even more geometrically from there. So no, don't expect 40% a month. Don't feel that permanent income hypothesis. Now, as usual, money management is still crucial. You know, we had a couple of good runs recently in some of these. We've got knock on wood, come in. We had, uh, <laughs> we've got two that are free rolling now, and then I hate to use the word hope, but we've got a couple of, two or three other ones that could turn into big winners. Uh, it, they're still viable, but as you just saw with that flat out losing trade, money management is still crucial. Now, let's say you go back into choppy mode, then you basically just rinse and repeat. Okay, I solicited uh, questions earlier and I got a couple that came in. And one is earnings season and impacts on setup for better or for worse. Do you have a modified approach? And I'm gonna kind of dig into this into in a few details. I guess I was not thinking about it from the news side, I'm thinking about it from the price action change because of earnings season. I guess regardless, you are saying it does not matter. A setup is a setup if there is pre-earnings run up on the price with the trigger and entry. But yeah, so basically, if you have a setup and you really like it, then take it. And I'm going to flesh this out in a lot of details in just one minute. Now, I didn't get around to answering this question, so let me just answer this real quick and we'll get back to the news and earnings. What type of market environment or price action would affect your pullback depth requirements? In other words, would you accept a shallower pullback? Does the whole market need to be running away? Or would you put more weight at individual stock pick? Now, in answer to this question, I like to match the pattern to the market. So let's say the market's bottoming out, making a bow tie off of multi-year lows and coming off of those lows. Then I'm looking for ideally transitional setups as opposed to stocks that are in longer term trends. As I said before, those might become a source of funds, even though conceptually it's correct. You do want to trade stocks and trends, but when the market is making a transition higher, you want to be in those stocks that are emerging from those lows. Now, your pullbacks for the transitional patterns are going to be fairly shallow. It's it's basically, you, you're just looking for a one bar pullback in some cases. So that one bar pullback might not be that deep. Now, as a general statement, I do like more deeper pullbacks than I used to. In more recent years, I tend to like a little deeper pullback because I know that that pullback has knocked out, that deeper pullback has knocked out some players. And also, I'm more likely to catch that reversion to the mean move for the swing trade back up to the old high, which is probably going to be right around when the profit target is. So it all kind of dovetails in quite nicely with the deeper pullbacks now if we're in a rip roaring bull market and you get these little bull flags in the market and we have gotten a couple of them lately let's just see what happens but the last bull flag worked out nicely the peas but if you start getting that type of action and that just keeps going and going and going i think that's what hal is alluding to then by all means you could trade more and more shallower pullbacks but the point i'm trying to make is match the pattern to the market so as we were kind of emerging in this new trend not that long ago, I saw a lot of you guys looking at these stocks having these long, long, long trends coming off all-time highs. Nothing wrong with that, but I would much rather be in something emerging because like I just said a second ago, 
those strong stocks could be a source of funds. Money managers might have big profits in those if they held onto them forever, and they might start dumping those stocks and start buying some stocks that are a little cheaper. Hopefully that made sense since that's something I've talked about quite a bit in the past. Okay. So last minute, I grabbed some slides from Trading Full Circle. And my point is I ignore all news, read my lips. And I'll say that over and over again. And then people will say, what about earnings? Like I ignore all news, <laughs> you know, read my lips. So I really think that news is noise. I'm not saying it doesn't affect the markets because it does, but at longer term, news is noise. Now, this is a dated slide, but this is from 2015 when I did trading full circle. We had Russian attacks, uh, but I guess Russia's attacking again. We had Syria, civil war, we had Greece bailout or not. That brief, Greece was getting ready to go bankrupt. By the way, the difference between Greece and us is the size of the printing press, as somebody had pointed out. We had a bull eye. We thought we were going to die from a bull eye. The Fed made a bunch of rumblings. China, I forget what China was doing, but China was doing what, whatever China was doing. Windows 10 was announced. There was a new iPhone every two weeks. There were three earning periods. There were the Iran nuclear deal, the Paul earthquake, liquid was found on Mars, and Matt Damon was left on Mars. That was a not a good movie, by the way. I never get those two hours of my life back. At least I was on a plane. I was on a plane on the way to Hong Kong. <laughs> I had earplugs in, and then I had my headphones over my ear earplugs as I was just trying to drown out the noise of the plane. I guess you get some noise canceling headphones, but I didn't have those. Anyway, uh, there was a beeping scene, and the stewardess comes she comes running up to me. She's like, "What's beeping?" I'm like, "I don't know." <laughs> Because I had the the it had it cranked up so loud. Anyway, so I talked about the news events in 2015, and then in 2016 you had the Paris attacks, Orlando attacks, Brexit, North Korea was launching rockets, Zika, Brussels bombing, Turkey attack, Turkey Turkey coup, RNC. We had a gorilla got shot, Pokemon Go, and then Pokemon went shortly thereafter. Yes, yes, Keith, you had the situation in Nigeria. Good, good, classic Dave Landry there. The private email server debacle and Zoolander 2 was released. So all these things happen. And the point I'm trying to make with this is, and this is borrowing a line of reason from Greg Morris, it's like, where did these, thing ha where did these things happen in the chart? Maybe you could pick out some of them but you certainly can't pick out all of them. And the same thing holds true, and I've showed stocks before with a lot, I've showed years of stocks, and then I want you to pick out where the earnings were if you don't know. Now, I'm not saying it doesn't have an effect on the markets, it does, but the reaction is often muted or short-lived. It's interesting, my favorite books on the stock market are at least 100 years old, and I'm always rereading these things like Reminiscence and G.C. Selden's book, which is the psychology of speculation, I want to say. They're all under davelander.com slash books dash two dash read. All those links, by the way, are down below. And the point I was trying to make is all these old books written by these speculators from the 1900s, they all talk about how the reaction is often muted or short-lived. They even have something from the 1800s here maybe I have a couple of those floating around. A lot of the same things you read, like in Livermore, they were talking about way back then. I think as I said before, sometimes if my wife goes to bed early on a, on a weekend and I've had a couple of beers, I'll come in here and, and get on uh, <laughs> get on eBay and look at look for old, old, old books on, uh, on trading. Anyway, the, the reaction is often muted or short-lived. The reaction is often the opposite of what it should be or not as much as it should be. And that's probably because it's already baked into the cake. People are looking for strong earnings and they come out with strong earnings. It's like, okay, now what? And sometimes that creates a bit of a liquidity event and institutions will start dumping. People start buying because earnings are great, but institutions will dump right on top. And next thing you know, the stock implodes. So basically trying to predict the markets based on news is an exercise of futility. If you could, I think a lot more journalists would be amazing traders.
Oh, that's what I actually said in the slide. That was just a random thought, but there it is. <laughs> I forgot it was in the slide. Okay, so as far as ignoring the news, years ago, Larry Connors said this, and I thought it was pretty, pretty good. He said, you have to take an all or none approach, okay? Now, I know Hal's talking a little bit about how the earnings are affecting the overall market. Well, you just look at what's happening. If the if price starts going down, the price is going down, okay? It doesn't matter why it's going down. It's like, why, well, why is it going up now? It's, it's, I had friends and family, had a lot of them open, over uh, over the weekend. We had a, um, my, what, what, what were we celebrating? Oh, my brother-in-law was in town, so we all got together here. And everybody's asking me, like, how's the market doing? I'm like, it's going up. It's like, well, how can it be going up with this going on and that going on? I'm like, I don't know. I'm trying to find more on Anyway, don't confuse the issue with facts as I preach. Now, if you're a pure swing trader, and that's something which I do not recommend, a pure short-term trader, and the reason I don't recommend that is because sooner or later, no matter what type of trader you are, you're going to get whacked pretty hard. And if you're a short-term trader, you can only make so much money over a short-term period of time or over a short period of time. So you're not going to make back what you lose. So short-term trading sounds great on paper, but in reality, it's a lot harder to make good longer-term money as a short-term trader because, again, sooner or later you're going to get whacked, and then it's going to take a lot of short-term trades to make up for that. So if you're a pure swing trader, which I do not recommend again, I would say you probably want to take a none approach when it comes to earnings. It's just not worth your while to get into a swing trade, get whacked on earnings, and then have to make a dozen trades to make up for that one losing trade. So you're better off ignoring, I'm sorry, you're better off ignoring your trading, not trading when there's an earnings looming. Now, by the way, you know, you guys can do whatever you want. This is the way I do it. I'm following the system. And that's one thing I kind of do a little bit more mechanically is like, okay, I've got a setup. I like the setup. I'm going to just not think about what's going on in the markets. And, you know, every now and then I'll get whacked, but every now and then I'll also catch a longer term trend. And if you are to catch a longer term trend, you have to take an all approach, meaning that you, you take every stock, even though their earnings looming. So the example that just pops in my head would be the, ARLP, which was one of the longest we stock, longest times we stayed in stock, a year and change, almost two years, I think. And during that period, obviously, there were a lot of earnings. And, you know, pick them out. I, don't, I have no idea where they are. It'd be a fun exercise to do that. I know you want to party with me. <laughs> but you can see, once you get into a longer term trend, all that news becomes more and more noise. I'm not saying that you can't get stopped out on news on short term trade. You 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 can, okay? But if you catch an occasional winner, it makes it all worthwhile. All right, any questions or thoughts on that? He says, lots of setups over the last two weeks, none triggered. Uh, we've had quite a few setups trigger lately. So, uh, but yeah, if, if if it's not triggering, then, then by all means, don't take the trade. All right, let's get this, uh, let's shift gears. All right, let me know if there's any crypto you wanna look at. I'm just gonna look at a few things here and then you guys can start asking about individual stocks and we'll jump into the overall market. I'm long Link, by the way, and I'm long Soul. Soul on a Landry Light pullback and you can, I got in right around here. It's not doing a whole lot just yet. This one I thought was kind of interesting. And I was looking at it back here, but I can't, it says it's cra you know, cracking, but I couldn't find it on my cracking. Let's take a look at the big boy, Bitcoin. Bitcoin not looking so good, as you can see. Look at a little questionable in here. Now, I would never trade off this, but it seems like every time Bitcoin gets whacked, some big players come back in and buy it at a bargain. But that's not a trading system. Do not do that. As a trend follower, I don't believe in that. But you can see we're hovering below the 30 EMA, about three days of Landry light. The good news is we haven't taken out the low end here, but the bad news is obviously we are below 30. 
and we are below a little bit of overhead supply here. So ideally, you want to see this thing get back at least into the range, and then obviously above and beyond. Let's take a look at Ethereum real quick. And you can see Ethereum not looking so hot. I don't have bit, I changed up my watch list. I don't have Bitcoin to Ethereum, but Bitcoin had been outperforming Ethereum for quite some time. As I say often, when crypto is really going, blowing and going, you could just get in these hot ones. And it's kind of a bummer because this, this one's really taken off and I don't have a position. But it is what it is. Anyway, the other thing I preach with crypto is don't buy anything that's below the 30 EMA. You're welcome. That in and of itself will keep you out of a lot of – look at that auction. Look at that thing. Yeah, the I'm going to miss the uh, brokerage I had, which had any pair you could ever imagine. I would take trades like this and just, you know, get that 100% pop in one day. It was just absolutely beautiful. But I no longer have that brokerage. They, they no longer supported the states. Your government's on a witch hunt against crypto. Now, here's the example I was telling you about. Don't buy anything below the, or, or a good example, don't buy anything below the 30 EMA. If that's all you did, you would avoid a lot of turds. I mean, look at this. You know, all these things are just losing, what, 90% of its value all below the 30 EMA. I mean, that's just, I know I'm a nerd, but that's just amazing to me that something so simple could keep you out of so much trouble. All right, let's shift gears. Not a whole lot happened to crypto. You know, my problem with crypto, as I often say, is I get all hot and heavy into it, and then the market kind of dries up or starts selling off, whatever the case may be. I get stopped out. And then I stopped doing my homework. It's not like stocks where I'm really on top of it every day. So that's one of my flaws that I probably need to work on. You've got to look at crypto or any market for that matter that you're thinking about trading every single day of your life because you don't know when it's going to change. And the problem with the crypto is it goes from 1999, meaning the end of the great bull market, to back to like 95 to like the beginning of the great bull market. And they could do that over a two or three day period. Anyway, S&P, big old fat outside day down. Spider should look similar. You can see gap higher, a little bit of follow through the upside, not much, but imploded today. So that's looking pretty ugly. How's that for an oxymoron from a trend following moron? Back to chart way out, like I was telling my service peeps tonight and you can't even see this bar, right? So it's not, it's not to get too excited about just yet. Also, we're not too, too far away from all-time highs, about 5% away or less than 5% away from all-time highs. And if we had a decent rally tomorrow, we'd be even closer, obviously. That's kind of a stupid thing to say, but you get the idea. It was a big old fat outside day, outside bar down. To me, it feels like the market just sucked everybody in this morning thinking that, okay, the Fed's done, let's buy stocks, happy days are here again, we're at multi-year highs or one-year plus highs, whatever the case may be, we're getting pretty damn close to those all-time highs, let's just throw in the towel and buy, and then, of course, the market comes right back in. Market will often do what it has to do to frustrate the most amount of people, it'll do what it has to do to cause the most pain in the most amount of people. It'll also do the most obvious in the most unobvious manner. And I borrowed a couple of those from Linda Rasky. I asked her, she said, you got them off the floor. I know I say this every week, but it definitely applies. Yeah, feel free to keep those stock picks coming. Thank you. But you can see that the obvious play would be to buy would be to buy this market. So what does it do? It gaps higher, so you got to reach for it, so to speak, and then it comes right back in. So we'll see how things shake out. It wouldn't stress me out too much if we had a bit of a pullback in here, maybe that's that much, maybe about something like this. And that would set up kind of like a double top knockout-ish looking pattern. We'll know it when we see it, like what's that guy's name, Peter Stewart? Justice Peter Stewart. NASDAQ was a bit of a flag, look at this little flag back here. That's kind of cool, right? And then nice rally out of it. That's almost like 1940s or 30s or 20s, whatever, Schaubach or pullback flag type pattern, Edwards and McGee. But you can see we had another little flag in here, gapped out of it, like, ooh, happy days are here again, and came right back in. 
But getting back to the NASDAQ, decent trend there, not too, too far away from all-time highs. It's got its work cut out for it, but we're getting there. And the trend so far, vis-a-vis -vis the big blue arrow, continues to point higher. Rusty opening gap reversal, that's a bit of a bummer, right at these almost one-year highs, or certainly highs for this year, right? Nope, came right back in. Russell's been all over the place, but it's slowly beginning to bottom out a little bit. Take a look at the weekly. You can see it's just consolidating in here, top of its range. I sure would like to see a breakout and not look back. Energy, speaking of breakouts, broke out a couple days ago, but then came right back in. Not the end of the world, not the end of the world just yet there. I sure would like to see some follow through to the upside, though. Let's take a look at the banks the banks have been in a, on a tear as of late which is good because we've almost retraced 100 percent of this debacle that we had not that long ago regionals which were hit the hardest or also working their way higher today notwithstanding they got whacked too today not the end of the world though so far the breaking above this range remains intact I'm showing you the banks, not because I want to rush out and buy banks at this juncture, but I'm showing you the banks because they were hit really hard, like the world's going to end, this was going to throw us back into the bear market or whatever, but then banks have become a little bit of what me worry. I wouldn't start kissing each other just yet, though. <laughs> but one day at a time, you can see what they're doing. Uh, financials got whacked pretty hard here, opening gap reversal, but they could actually use a bit of a correction, and this could set up if we had an, a, if this high was a little bit lower than that one it would set up a double top knockout type of pattern double top knockout is just a micro double top and then a knockout type of bar similar to the tko except you got a minor little double top drugs recently broke out but unfortunately have come right back into where they broke out from as long as they stay somewhere around the top of this range ideally an outside of this range they're okay. If they come back in, then we're back into the soup, so to speak. I worked with a hedge fund manager years ago. He always called it the soup when their market would break out and then come right back in. Manufacturing getting hit a little bit today, but that looks pretty good. It looks kind of like a knockout type of move. So far, nice uptrend remains intact there. Retail in general has been doing pretty good. A little bit of a reversal today, but you can see pretty darn good trend there. Nice persistent trend higher. The trannies, let's find them. Here they are. A little bit of a reversal today, but they're just off of all-time highs. So that's certainly looking pretty good. A lot of people like to watch the trannies to see if they support the overall market. That's probably comes from Dow theory. Software pulling back in here, not the end of the world. If it keeps coming back, though, obviously, if it gets back below this prior peak, I would be concerned. But so far, it looks pretty good, just kind of pulling back. Semiconductors defy gravity today, which is cool. Now, they're getting a little choppy here, and they're getting a little sideways. That's my only concern. I sure would like to see them bust out and not come back. If you've been following me for a year or 20, you probably know that I'm a big fan of the semis confirming what's going on in the overall market. And the reason is, one somebody had once said, like the transports used to transport the goods, and they tried to kind of poo-poo the transports in more recent years, but if you think about it, there's a lot of stuff still coming in on Amazon. <laughs> My daughter once was behind a Mack truck and she said there was a bumper, the guy had a bumper sticker. He said, tired of all these trucks? Stop buying shit, <laughs> which I thought was funny. Anyway, so the semiconductors are kind of like the information superhighway, so to speak, right? And there's a lot of excitement about technology and all that technology is going to take a lot of electronics, AI, quantum computing, et cetera. But you see, semiconductors actually were up a percent and a half today plus, but well off their best level. So that's a bit of a bummer. The good news is we're not too, too far away from all-time highs. I just would feel a lot better if all these areas would bang out some all-time highs and stay there. Okay, MOD for Keith. Yeah, that looks pretty good. You got a bit of a flag pattern there. Now, this is one of those possible source of fun type stocks, okay? You broke out of this little range. Somebody must have asked about this last week because I got it marked up. And you got a little bit of a pullback. So that looks pretty good. But I would rather, I'd rather be in something like the KF we just talked about. Of course, that's probably a bad example, but it's an IPO just coming off of these brand new highs. Uh, like the SIM might be a better example. 
not right now, but earlier on, nope, that's all time highs too. So not a perfect example there, but not, not in a super longer term uptrend. You want to find something, I think at this juncture, that's not extended so much to the upside. Not that that's a bad looking stock. There's nothing wrong with it, but I would try to find something that's in a little bit earlier stage trending, but a little bit earlier stage of the trend. And then also notice that if we pull back too much further, it's going to be pretty much where it just broke out from. And it's okay, but notice that this trend is just a couple of big wide range bars higher. So overall, I'm going to give you a, a, a not bad, almost a pretty good on that one. But I'm going to pass for those reasons, just because you're at these major, 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 I think all time highs, I guess, in this particular case. And a stock like this, especially the market begins to tank a little bit, like we saw today, could become a source of funds really fast. So be careful with that. Four. Yeah, it's trending. Yeah, you're at all-time highs here, maybe on a pullback. But again, try to find something that's that's not quite already way up here at all-time highs. Uh, find something that's that's moving and possibly has the potential without a whole lot of overhead resistance. I don't know which ones are on the Landry list and which ones, well, let me just, like BTBT, BT, I think we're already along that one. In fact, I know we're along that one. You see this BTBT, BT, I mean, it's a fantastic look at trend, okay? It's pulled back. I think we got in back here, okay? But if you back the chart way out, this thing could just be getting started. And I'm, I'm like crazy bullish on all these crypto stocks because they hung in there fairly well they've been hanging in there fairly well in spite of the crypto market being a little questionable bitcoin especially but i think that if bitcoin begins to rally i think it's like these stocks are going to be like the ball under the water like if you push a ball in the water and just comes flying up so find something that looks a little bit more like that you could have a great trend like this but bigger picture wise if it's coming off of major lows like that especially since the market's not to all-time highs yet, the market's still kind of in the early first leg, you could argue, of a bull market. Try to find something that's emerging. All right, any more? I know we talk about stocks all day in Facebook. It's a sort of the group we don't get as many, but I tell you what, if you're watching this live, then, oh, oh, let me rewind it. If you're not watching this live, then join us live and bring bring your stock picks, and I'll be happy to take a look at them. Okay, any more? Going once, going twice. Well, obviously, I want to thank everybody for attending, and I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. Anything unanswered, bring it up at Facebook. If you're not a member of Facebook or DaveLander.com, which you have to be a member of to be at Facebook, then you could shoot me an email at DaveLander.com, or ideally on YouTube, leave a comment below, and I will answer it. I answer all comments that require answering. Everybody, enjoy your weekend. If we don't talk between now, and then it made a trend be with you.